So Eric Kutcher, uh, I'm the managing partner of McKinsey's Western Region. It's a true pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here because I think it's time we frame this particular issue as one of the most strategic issues facing business today. And it's an invitation for both men and women to solve this issue. So uh, I was asked as we kick off this panel to do two things. I was asked to share a bunch of the research that we've done on women in the economy. I was also asked to share some of the perspectives I have as a leader of a reasonable size organization here on the West Coast. Um, we have a lot we should actually be proud of. The research would say if you look over a 30 year period, we now have almost 50% or a little over 50% uh, of the working population as women, right? That's, that, that leads to about 26% growth of our GDP, meaning if we didn't get from where we were 30 years ago today, our economy would be over 25% smaller than it is today. We also have some wonderful, wonderful role models that our women can look up to. Think about some of the iconic companies whose CEOs are women today. IBM with Ginny Rometty, HP with Meg Whitman, GM with Mary Barra, Yahoo with Marissa Meyer. Right? These are some tremendous role models for our women to look up to and say they've broken through that barrier. At the same time, we have a lot of work to do. And as we look at it, nearly, uh, we have absolutely hit a plateau. We've absolutely uh, stalled out in terms of progress. And one of the charts I'd love to show is a bit of the progression and how much harder it is for our women to reach the executive levels of our companies. And this was done, um, some research in Europe. I can promise you we've done this in the US as well. It does not change. And what you will see is, again, a little over 50% of, of our entry level positions are filled by women. And you can look two to five times harder as you move up towards, and look how much harder it is to become CEO, or look how much harder it is to become part of that executive committee. And if you look at our boards, it's the same exact challenge. One of the things that I've always heard is, well, it's, it's a selection bias. It's a desire to move out of some of these opportunities. And this is one of those, oops, this is one of those things that I found to be truly eye-opening because it dispelled all of the myths that we talk about. And what you can see here is um, for those senior and mid-level management, how many people, both men and women, Look at these as a desire to reach the top, a willingness to sacrifice to get there. There is virtually no difference. Statistically, there is no difference. There is a difference in confidence to get there, which is one of the things we absolutely have to be aware of. We've got a lot of biases that we have to overcome. But very clearly, this is not, the previous chart is not because people, the women don't want to be there. It's for a whole lot of issues that we need to now work through. Um, through the course of the research, um, we've spent a lot of time understanding what executives that have been successful do. And in this context, um, I'm not going to read you. This is, some of the, uh, this is some of the findings or some of the synthesis from having now met with quite a number of CEOs that we would have said have pushed the envelope. And uh, I thought I'd make it a little bit personal um, in terms of what this has meant for me as a leader to try to make this change inside of McKinsey. And I think the first thing when you read this chart, there is no silver bullet, right? There is no single answer that's going to make a difference. This is going to take a lot of things. And so uh, inside the firm, inside the West Coast, uh, inside the offices, and we have uh, soon to be five here in the Western region um, and some, you know, 500 consultants, right? So it's a reasonable size organization. The first thing uh, I did is um, this past January, I stood up in front of all of my partners and I declare this as one of our top three issues, right? This issue, which has not been talked about amongst the partnership broadly, because we've always viewed this as we've had women's initiatives, but it's been a women's initiative. We've now made this a priority for all of us, for all of the partners to get through this. Um, the second is I made it a point to meet with every woman on the West Coast over a 60 day period, some over dinner, some over breakfast, some one on one. But it became an absolute priority for me to demonstrate that the leader of their, the leader to them cares deeply about them as individuals, right, and collectively as the progress. The third, and I think this is an important one, we decided there, because there was no silver bullet, we had to solve this at a segment of one, right? There was no answer that uniformly made a difference. We had to look at each and every one of our women and say, how do we make this work for them? How do we make them successful individually? The next is I, I sat in front of my partners and I said, we have burned the bridges. Over 40% of our incoming class are women, right? It has been for the last two years. If we don't 
change that change that waterfall that I showed you, we won't have a firm, we won't have a partnership in 10 years, right? And it's not that we don't do okay, but we're nowhere near where we should be. And I think that's an important element of what we need to go do. I made a bunch of leadership changes. So I put three women uh, in our five most important positions, right out of the five, three are now women. I think that was very telling. It gave our uh, more junior women a lot of confidence that we took this very seriously. Um, we do something every year we call Values Day where we get together and we talk about our values. For folks outside the firm, they can't fathom that you would take the entire firm everywhere globally, get them together in small groups and talk about our values. This year, we're doing a whole training. That day will be dedicated to a training on something called Center Leadership, all about understanding the biases that we all have uh, and how we overcome them and be much more aware. And the last is, uh, we've been very thoughtful about the language in our reviews to avoid some of those biases that we often have especially early, for our women earlier in their career about things that we observe that look a little different than some of our men, right? But actually don't really change their ability to counsel clients and to be successful. Um, so uh, that's a little bit of the research and it's a little bit of kind of at least how I viewed it as a leader uh, uh, inside the firm. I'd love now to open it up to our panelists and invite them to the front of the room. So what a privilege to have you all here. Uh, George, I thought we might start with you, if you don't mind introducing yourself first and then talked a little bit about the journey you went on uh, to make great progress at Kaiser Permanente. Um, I'm George Halverson. I am just retired as chair and CEO of Kaiser Permanente at the beginning of January and I'm, I'm now um, going down a path of working on some issues of uh, racial conflict, ethnic conflict, and also early childhood development. So I'm working on some topics that I'm having a lot of fun with. Kaiser Permanente, um, we have a massive commitment to diversity. We are a very diverse organization. When I got there, we were 49% minority. When I left, we were 59% minority. We, When you look at our senior officers, um, we have eight regional presidents, only two of them are white males. When you look at our three group presidents, we have three group presidents who run uh, basic operations and none of them are white males. And our, our chief financial officer is a woman, our controller. When you look at our overall performance as an organization, um, we are number one on Medicare, we're number one on J.D. Powers, we're number one on Consumer Reports. Every single measure of quality, uh, we're at the top of the list. Every service measure, consumer reports that we're the best brand in healthcare, that's a company led by women. When you look at our board of directors, it's 40% white male. And so we have a very diverse organization. And one of the things you get when you have a very diverse organization is synergy. And you get synergy because people who look up the chain of command see somebody else who looks like them in the chain of command. And, and that's very empowering, particularly if you're a diverse organization. And is this working? Okay. <clears throat> uh, one, of, one of the things that I, I've actually coached a number of CEOs of other companies, and they say, we love diversity, we're focused on diversity, we're committed to diversity, we're going to be very diverse. And then I say, okay, um, I've seen your annual report. I said, Tell me this, if you right now, you personally went to another company that you really wanted to work for in a job you really wanted to have, and you got the annual report, and you looked at the annual report, and you saw that every single person in the C-suite, the CFO, the, the C, CEO, the CMO, they're all black women. What do you think your chance would be of getting ahead in that company? And they say, oh, is that what it looks like? And I say, yeah, that's what it looks like. Look at your annual report and imagine that you are coming from any of the diverse parts of this organization. When they look at the senior level, it's, it's clones. And if you look up at KP, at the senior level, you can't find hardly, barely any layers where you've got two, three people up in a chain of five that are the same race or ethnicity. And that works. When you create a synergy, when you focus on the patient, when you focus on the outcomes, when you focus on team care, when you organize the company as teams, teams naturally create a synergy. 
and inside the teams, you ignore your prior issues of race and ethnicity and you focus on the patient. So team-based care focused on the patient is very, very empowering and it gets people to look at a higher level and then move away from it. So at, at Kaiser Permanente, we basically made uh, diversity a major agenda. We made women's issues a major agenda and um, we have proven that an organization that has women senior leadership across the board not only does as well, and, and I'll, I'll end with um, uh, the um, <clears throat> largest systems project in the history of the planet was an indie business on the, in the planet was done at Kaiser Permanente, a $4 billion project. And, and one of my basic beliefs is that there are two organizational models that we have wired into us instinctively. One is the hunter model, and the hunter model is the hunter-warrior model, chain of command, task-oriented, get things done, heroes in, in the process, and the gatherer model, and the gatherer model is collaborative, cooperative, you bring people together, you, you work in a collaborative way, and you figure out how to get things done in a collaborative model. Both of those processes are led. Both of those processes take leadership. It looks different. You don't see the leadership often in the collaborative model because part of the skill set is not to be in the spotlight. And on the hunter model, the major part of the skill set is to be in the spotlight so you get promoted. So when you've got both those models in a today's complex world, you really need the gatherer model. So the largest systems project we, in the history of the planet, KP Health Connect, we had Louise Liang come in and run it. And Dr. Liang was a White House fellow. She's very bright. Uh, she was chief operating officer for a couple hospital systems, but we put her in charge of that $4 billion project and she delivered it on time by making it a collaborative project and bringing all the people together in a collaborative mode to get it done. And so you need to, if, we, if I would have put someone in charge of that project who did it in a chain of command dictatorial model, it would have done like every other major systems project happens, it would have failed at, <laughs> failed at multiple levels and cost us a lot of money. But because we had a, collab, a brilliant leader who led with a collaborative model, we ended up getting it done. So that's kind of a Kaiser Permanente short story. That's great. If, if I can follow up with one question. Yeah. Uh, recently retired as the, as the CEO and chairman of, of, of KP, um, and you've learned a lot, I suspect, over the course of that journey. If there was one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you started, what would that be? And, and how far back are you going in that? <laughs> I'll leave that one to well, you. Well, <laughs> actually, um, I, I, didn't, um, I did not start as a collaborator. I, I did not start in my career as somebody who um, brought teams together. I started as a hunter model. I basically had chains of command. I gave orders. I directed people. And back in Minnesota, I ran a health plan that was a, a staff model health plan that looked like KP. And one of the women who was one of my department heads um, who put some clinics together and, and did some work for us, I did them all with great success. And um, so I trusted her and gave her bigger projects. And I gave her a project of moving 1,500, we built this magnificent new clinic and we were moving 1,500 doctors from a couple different clinics into this new clinic and we would need to do it with no deterioration in patient care. So um, I signed her the project and then came back a couple weeks later and I said, okay, show me the plan. And she said, well, there really isn't one. And I said, show me the, the, the charts, show me, you know, what, and she said, there isn't one. And I said, well, who's gonna, are you gonna supervise this, and she said, I'll tell you what I've done. She said, I've gone to every department who's gonna move. I've taken them all to the new site. I've shown them where they're gonna be. And I said, each of you now plan your move and tell me what resources you need. She gave them a template to plan the resources and they plan the resources off that template. And I said, well, what's the master list? How are you gonna know if you're off? And she said, no, there is no master list. This is the model. And so we saw patients until noon on Friday that whole process happened over the weekend, and we saw patients again at noon on Monday with no break, and it worked. And I converted. I said, holy cow. <laughs> I could, there's no possible way any part of my skill set could have made that happen. <laughs> so then I started trying to learn how to be a collaborative leader from that point. That's great. Thank you. Jim, maybe we can switch over to you. Uh, you can introduce yourself. And uh, one of the things, I, at least I've been told, is at, uh, at PwC, you've, you and the organization have really focused on leadership training and would love to hear a bit about kind of the, the, the story and the journey from that point of view. Sure, thanks. Um, and thank you for the repeating the question. I would have forgot, but um, 
So from my, my own perspective and, and why I'm here, um, for starters, I look at the, uh, the progress and results over my working career and actually over my lifetime. And if you think about um, where we've been on this journey and just go back five decades, um, I don't think the pipeline has changed a whole lot, somewhat, but not a whole lot in terms of who's entering the workforce. And I think that's borne out in your uh, statistics you showed, Eric. But um, we've made incremental progress, I think, in terms of uh, women represented in the management and leadership and executive and board ranks. But we have so far to go. And, and it's just nowhere near uh, the result that we should be seeing. So there's something that's just not working right. And I'm really interested in what we can do to try to accelerate progress uh, because I don't think that we've, we've reached a... Uh, We've reached a plateau, but I don't think it's the right plateau to end on. So I'm hopeful that we'll make some breakthroughs and be interesting to see what comes out of the conversation. As far as PwC and then what we've done to help to address women in the leadership ranks uh, and leadership in general, um, I think it's a combination of uh, building awareness within the firm of the issue. So starting with laying out the facts um, you have a bunch of accountants to start with, and the business is quite different today. But when I started, it was mostly a bunch of accountants, so you're very rules and data-based. Um, so it's easy to get people's attention with facts and data, and then you help to build awareness about the why, what's driving that, and then uh, the hard part is getting people to actually internalize and act on something and, and operate differently. So we focused a lot on um, the structures that we need to put in place, starting with tone at the top, um, role modeling, set an example of what it takes to uh, truly sponsor a diverse group of um, professionals into increasingly higher levels of responsibility. Um, you can see it in our executive team. It's quite different than what it looked like 10, 20 years ago. We're now um, a third women in our U.S. leadership ranks. If you look at my own team in San Francisco, I'm the managing partner for our San Francisco market. And um, of the seven people uh, on my team, uh, four are, excuse me, five are women, and I'm the only straight white male in the group. Now, the problem with that is I'm the one in charge of the office, but we work very much as a, as a team. And uh, one of my goals is that the succession list for my job um, includes a diverse set of individuals, all of whom are qualified to take on the role. Uh, when you look at the structures in PwC, a couple of comments there. Um, being an organization uh, probably very similar to yours, Eric, um, it's, it's uh, partner-owned and managed, and therefore a lot of driving change is dependent on um, alignment across a very broad set of um, stakeholders. And that's, that's a bit of herding cats in a large organization but um, you have to really get alignment at, on the objective. That's not hard to do on this topic, but then getting people to act on it, uh, people generally respond to um, some clarity around rules and what it is we're trying to accomplish and how we get there. Um, one of the things is every individual partner in our annual objectives um, lists a set, and it's a minimum of three individuals, diverse individuals, who we take personal responsibility for sponsoring into their next uh, position of responsibility. And, and it's, it's a very specific part of our evaluation and it's equally weighted with all the other things that we do. And I think that's driven a lot of change as well. Um, the other thing that we've done that gets to more of the personalization and, and kind of creating a real level of empathy is we've been training um, all of our people on uh, implicit bias. And a lot of you, I'm sure, have seen some of the great work that was done by Dr. Benarji, and, and we've actually used her in some of our own training classes for our leadership team. Um, that's actually getting people to understand you know, what is it like um, on the other side. Uh, to George's example, I think that's the most powerful thing you can do and probably the biggest change in my own uh, perspective because awareness was easy. I grew up in a family where I had three older sisters and a very strong mother who worked and um, I always knew who was in charge and was, um, so, so that, that wasn't hard, but actually when you get in positions where you can um, actually walk in somebody else's shoes and do it in a way where you can feel it, 
then I think that's transformative. And so that was probably my, my big awakening. But um, I think getting people to understand, you know, what biases look like and what does it feel like when you're um, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and you're in a meeting and you start hearing comments when we're evaluating women and the comments start to sound like, um, you know, this person's too aggressive or this person isn't tough enough to make a decision or stand up for the firm in the boardroom. And you think, did I just hear that? Um, and, and I think a lot of people too, you just kind of open your, your mind and your heart to those things. Just, um, you don't really relate to the comments and, and, uh, act on them. So anyway, I'll pause there and move on. This, this is great. Thank you. Um, just again, one follow up. Uh, we heard a bit of George's kind of aha moment, right? When he learned to be a collaborative leader, what was your aha moment? I think my, my biggest aha moment and it is, um, what I went through on that point of actually um, experiencing uh, being in somebody else's shoes. And, and this was um, in a program around in Atlanta when I lived there and it was around uh, racial um, issues. And, you know, I, I got into um, diversity. I grew up in a diverse environment, but I, I moved to Atlanta from San Jose and, um, had that, um, I was the one that raised their hand and said, why is it that inside our office, we don't look like the community that I live in. And so I took on some just leadership roles in the firm, um, on that topic of, of racial, um, disparity and trying to get our own firm to a point of, um, you know, represent proportionate representation with the community we lived in. Anyway, one of the programs I went through as part of that journey was, um, a, a weekend of a deep immersion, um, and um, it was actually in the Leadership Atlanta program. And they took us, and it was um, an individual that um, grew up with a father who was on Dr. King's um, staff and, and took this group of kind of a mixed um, gender and, and uh, mostly black and, and Caucasians and locked us up in a hotel room. And, and um, we didn't know what the program was because it was a secret but basically led us in without us knowing into a role-playing process. And, uh, you know, the white people all ended up just absolutely mad, just pissed off about what was going on in this program. And we really didn't know until the second day what he was doing to us. But we, we came out of it. I won't go through the details. But we actually came out of it with a very different level of understanding. What did that feel like to me? So anyway, I think that's important. Great. Thank you. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, if you don't mind starting the same way with a bit of an introduction and why you're excited to be here, and then maybe tell a bit of the journey at Sandia. Okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here and to share our story and to hear the other stories as well. Uh, so I'm Steve Rotler, and I'm the uh, vice president for uh, the California Laboratory for Sandia National Laboratories, which is based in Albuquerque, but we have quite a large operation here in California. And uh, I'm responsible for that. I also manage uh, one of what I think in the private sector would be recognized as a business unit. We think of it a little differently given that we're a nonprofit. And uh, let's see, the reason this is so important to me and all of my colleagues at Sandia is that uh, we're a nonprofit and a federally funded research and development center. And so for us, the most important thing at our laboratory is the people who work there. And in order to keep, in order to attract and retain uh, some of the smartest people on the face of the planet for very long careers, which flies in the face of what most other organizations uh, are able to do, but is very important for us in terms of the stability of our mission, the work environment is of paramount importance. And uh, we, made a, we made a commitment uh, as an executive team and now working it down through the laboratories four years ago to take on once and for all uh, the issues of uh, diversity and inclusion that were that were uh, creating some corrosion in in our work environment, and the reason uh, for me personally, the reason this is so important is, and this uh, this uh, begins to get to the journey issue as well, is uh, about four years ago when we as an executive team team agreed we were going to tackle this, we all made an agreement with each other that we were going to participate in. Uh, a leadership development program that had been brought to our attention. Um, there are many programs like this, so I won't name the program. But the focus of the program was uh, around uh, white male privilege and unconscious bias. 
<laughs> you know, when we talked about this inside the lab, first of all, when it became known that the, that the, that the executive team, uh, the males, were going to go off to this thing called a, uh, a white, I think the title of the course was White Man's Caucus. <laughs> you know, immediately many in the lab said, and just what in the hell are you going to learn about diversity by a bunch of white males coming together in such a course? And, uh, you know, I had questions myself. And like, uh, like most leadership development programs, you dread going because it's time away from the things that you think are most important. And then when you get there, you find it's very liberating and intellectually stimulating. And I would say I've been to many leadership development programs over my career. Uh, this, uh, along with one other, I would say, had a, the most profound effect on me because, you know, I, I was raised uh, primarily by women. Uh, there are three women in my life that uh, have had a huge impact on my development. In fact, I frequently say I am the man I am because of those three women. And uh, I always have prided myself on being very open-minded and broad in my thinking. But I realized as I came out of this experience four years ago that I really thought of diversity and inclusion in overly simplistic ways, and actually in ways that were not helpful to the cause to which I was already intellectually committed, but maybe didn't quite understand how to fully engage as a leader. And uh, this class that I took uh, really helped me get past that. Uh, you know, for example, um, th this course, all these courses have frameworks, and this framework really spoke to me because it, it talked about white male privilege and unconscious bias in the context of how Western society developed and to help, to help white males understand where this came from and to help white males understand that just by being a white male, you get certain privileges whether you realize it or not. You don't ask for them. Most white males don't ask for them, but you can't deny them either. You can't turn them down. It's not like you can walk away from them. You just get them by virtue of the fact that you're a white male. And then the course is built around four paradoxes. I won't share all four with you, but I am going to share two because for me, I carry them around every day and I talk about them regularly. Uh, the first one is, and this was, this was very powerful, and that is, it's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. So for me, that's when the light bulb clicked on for me as a leader. I, you know, I never was too hung up on it wasn't my fault, but I use the it's not my fault and I live my life in a positive way as a way of saying, so therefore I'm done, right? I just have to keep doing that and I've fulfilled my responsibility. But once I came to better understand the, the, you know, the, socio the sociological factors in Western society, which is mostly what companies, both in the private sector and the public sector, are based on here in the United States, although that's changing. Once I came to understand that that's a reality and that I'm a leader in that environment, then it clicked for me that, yeah, right, it, it's, it's not my fault. I was raised to be a good man. I believe I live my life as a good man. I believe I do all the things my mother and my grandmother and my wife have you know, ingrained in me over the years. But it, I can't escape the fact that as a leader in an organization, it is my responsibility to recognize that these things exist and to do something about them. So for me as a leader, I found that extremely energizing because then it didn't become something simplistic about numbers and how you recruit and all of that. That's important. But I began to see how I personally could get engaged both at the emotional level and, and using the power of my position and, and uh, the resources I have available to me and my time and all of that. The second paradox, which, which had a profound impact on me once I understood it, was the paradox of sameness and difference. I was raised um, uh, and spent a lot of time early in my life in Texas, which has you know, a, a bundle of problems in this area in my view, uh, in their culture and in the society. I say that about my home state, which I love. Um, but I was raised in an environment, the way I was taught about diversity was uh, ignore differences because if you pay attention to differences and you highlight them, then you're, you're taking the step into the space of eventually being discriminatory. So I was taught to suppress differences. And for me, you know, I look back on it now, I say it's such a simple concept, but, but I didn't grasp it when I went into this uh, leadership development effort, is that uh, you have to learn to live comfortably with the paradox of sameness and difference. Because at our core, we're all the same. We all want to be ourselves. We all want to be accepted as ourselves. We all want to bring the full measure of ourselves into any interaction, and especially at work. We don't want to live our lives at work differently than we live them uh, when we're at home or with family and friends. So we're all the same in that regard, uh, but we're also different. And it's our differences that make us unique. And that when I, as a leader or as a human being, suppress somebody else's difference from me, I am, in effect, sending them a signal, and it's a powerful signal if it comes from a leader. I am sending them a signal that I don't value their difference, that I don't recognize it. The thing that makes them unique and the thing that they want to bring into the workplace, I'm sending them a tacit message that it's not okay. And that's not okay. 
So for me, those, those paradoxes, there were two others which I won't bore you with here, but for me it was a, a tremendously, it was a profound experience and for me, it turned uh, my commitment to uh, diversity and inclusion into a very personal one, one that I connect with uh, both morally and emotionally. The idea that in my institution, we would have even one employee out of the 11,000 smart people we employ who would feel that when they come to our place of work, that they couldn't be themselves, that they have to leave some piece of themselves in the parking lot to be picked up when they go home at night, um, taps a very strong emotional response for me. It's just, uh, I can't stand it. And uh, for me, it was at that moment that I said, okay, now I get as a leader, I, not only do I have this responsibility, but, but I'm energized by it and passionate about doing something about it. And that's why I'm here today. That's great, thank you. Then the paradoxes, I think, really, really ring true with all of us. As a leader, you, uh, you have to acknowledge and face and uh, fight some of the biases. Maybe describe some of the, if you will, the battles that you're fighting every day when it comes to these biases. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think uh, given, I won't bore you with the details of our environment, but let me just say we have a very important uh, technical mission we hire, uh, truly, we hire some of the smartest people on the face of the planet. And so I mean, that's a privilege to go to work at a place like that every day. But it brings with it a, uh, a bundle of things that make uh, managing in a complex environment very difficult. Right? We get the advantage of working with really smart people. So once you connect with them intellectually, a lot of the bad stuff goes away and, and you get kind of what you want. But sometimes uh, you have to get past a lot of baggage. Uh, really smart people frequently are some of the most insecure people on the face of the planet. Uh, they can be a bundle of insecurities and, and oftentimes in ways that they hide very, very well. And you oftentimes don't know that that's what you're dealing with or that, that you've tapped into. I often find that uh, some of the most talented people on the face of the planet are some of the most close-minded people on the face of the planet because they're so smart and they work through a problem and they get to a solution and then it's about defending that solution, which means they're no longer open to other possibilities. And in the space that I live and work in, you know, day in, day out, I don't do technical work anymore. I, I, I lead uh, technical professionals. Space I deal in is uh, very complex and it's very ambiguous and it's not prone to the use of the scientific method, at least to get successful solutions. So I think, I'm not answering this question very well, I feel, but for me, the, the challenge that I have is opening up the minds of the people who, who work for us. Um, they, uh, another thing, Malin and I uh, have one of my colleagues here with me today. Malin and I were talking about this on the way over here this afternoon. Um, yeah, our attrition rate at our lab, this is going to stun some of you, uh, it's like uh, 4% per year. I mean, it's, it's very, co I do 40 year anniversaries all the time. This is very, very common at our laboratory. When we get to 6% attrition rates, you just can't imagine the hand wringing in our executive offices about the world is coming to an end, the lab is going, you know, going into a really bad place. That's a, that's a real strength for us because we get talent, we get to keep it for a long, long time, we move people around a lot, we give them very challenging things to do. Um, but what comes with that is say, uh, when you have someone that's been at a place for a long time, especially working in the world we work in, in a, in a frankly, a very, Malin and I were talking about this too, a very favored place when you get right down to it. A very, there are very few organizations that have what we have in terms of a mission and, and the kind of support that they get and the opportunity to do what we do. But what comes with that is over time, you lose, you lose connection with the outside world. You lose that sense of calibration. You lose sight of the fact that the world has moved on. It's not like what it was when I came to the lab in 1985. And, uh, and I find dealing with that to be, to be a real challenge, especially in this space. Uh, change is very hard to come at, at our laboratories. You can't mandate it. You can't direct it. Um, it's a competency-based culture. The only way you get it is you have to connect with people's intellect, because until you connect with their intellect, there's no way their behavior will change. They'll just simply, at best, give you passive-aggressive passive -aggressive buy-in, which gets you only a little bit until you turn your attention to other things, and then you, you don't have what you want. So this is a question for uh, all of you. Um, I think Congresswoman Spire kind of pointed this out to us pretty clearly when she asked a few of us to raise our hands. Uh, and you look out, and it's quite startling, um, uh, the percentage of uh, women versus men uh, in the audience. And so if we set an aspiration that when we got back together next year and had this same panel, and next year we wanted 50% uh, of the audience to be men, 
what do you think we have to do to make that happen? Maybe Jim, you can start. Yeah, I would just start by um, those who are here. Um, we have networks, we have responsibilities, and and exercise our leadership and engage in our network and talk about the personal value we get out of this conversation and why it's an important topic. George, do you wanna? Yeah, I think targeted marketing would make the, the most sense. Uh, Jim Jim has membership list, he knows who the, the folks are. And, and if we communicated with those folks about the value of this particular meeting and why it would make sense to get them to the next year's meeting, I think that's the, that's the audience and might be the best mechanism. I just had an idea in the moment, <laughs> which means I love might, those ideas. might not be a good one. Um, and I tend to talk to think, so it may really be a bad idea. But um, I'm reflecting on my own experience. And uh, Tracy and I were talking about this at the break. That, um, you know, for me, I'm not sure I'd be where I am had I not had an opportunity to be just with a group of males to talk about this topic when I first had to really do a deep dive into it. You know, many males a struggle with this issue of it's not my fault, but it's my responsibility. You know, I, I knew it, was, when I went to that class, I knew it wasn't my fault. I was pretty confident it wasn't my fault, but I couldn't get to the other side to recognize, but it is my responsibility. And I needed, frankly, a safe environment where I could determine my own level. This is another thing I forgot to mention. This class I went to, a week long, first night, first hour of people teaching it said, first rule, you choose your level of participation. We're not going to nag you. We're not going to call on you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to put you on the spot. You choose the extent to which you're going to participate. I was telling Tracy at the break, for me, that's all I needed to hear because then I wanted to participate. I couldn't, get, I couldn't participate fast enough because it was in my control. And, and I, think, I think a lot of males find this a very difficult topic to talk about in a mixed gender audience or mixed ethnicity audience because many males are so conflicted about it. And, and, it, and maybe one thing that could be done to help increase the, the male uh, participation, because it struck me too when I walked in, Mon and I were standing at the back of the room and I said, what do you notice about the gender demographics? We both got it like that. One thing that might be helpful is to consider doing a session just for men and, and find a way to, to get men to face some of these issues and what their responsibility as leaders are in helping deal with them in, in US culture. Yeah, just to add on quickly to that, um, one of the things we have done in PwC is started a, uh, a set of meetings where we'll get a group of just uh, men in our local offices and uh, facilitated by one of our diversity team members uh, and just have a conversation where you can put everything on the table. And um, one thing I was, I was really proud to see is uh, Moray, who's over here, who's our local uh, CDO, um, told me who was going to be the leader within our office of um, this roundtable session for the men. And I started laughing, and um, she probably remembers. And I said, who's it really going to be? Um, but, uh, and, and the only reason I laughed is, is there's uh, just, just one of our um, uh, more senior males who's just a, a little bit quirky and... Um, points out things that other people don't see. And um, I, I, never, I never saw him as a champion for diversity, it, which was really interesting. And it made me think about, do I really know my partners? And am I asking the right questions if, if that was my reaction? But it led to a conversation with him about why is he interested in this? And, and so I, I think um, there's, there's a real power in having a... a perceived safe environment for men to actually, you know, go and have this conversation and be honest with each other about it. So I'll leave with one last thought, uh, and then I'll thank the panelists. I think this notion of having the honest conversation is absolutely critical. I will say, personally, by framing it as the strategic question, at least in our firm, where you have an obligation, an absolute obligation to weigh in on anything that is of strategic importance, Right, you no longer can allow someone to back away from having it, and it invited everyone to participate uh, with a very open and honest set of dialogues that I think are very much what you're uh, both talking about. Uh, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm from the Representation Project, and I work with a lot of corporate groups to screen uh, our document, our first documentary, Misrepresentation, um, as part of to spark a diversity conversation. I often am speaking with a women's network. 
and they always ask me, how do we get men to come to the screening? And I'm wondering, hearing what you're saying just now, about whether the employee resource group as the organizer has actually siloed the conversation and that we're just not going to get men in the room, even if they invite them, as long as it's a women's network. So help me get more men to see our film. This is just a, a bit of a, a quick story that may, may or may not help you. Um, but uh, we just took all 85 or 90 of our partners from the West Coast to a, to a three-day offsite. Um, where this topic, we spent an hour and a half on this topic, by the way, pretty unexpectedly. When I listed the priorities for the year, and this is one of them, we went into the most open and honest dialogue that I've ever been part of. Quite frankly, thanks to one of our women partners who said, guys, you're not getting it. Um, and then we went into a, a fascinating session where we invited all of our women partners and all the men par male partners to a fireside chat that we were going to videotape and actually share with uh, all of our uh, non-partners. And uh, we, didn't, by the way, we knew there was going to be a cocktail hour, or happy hour that our women were going to go to. We didn't actually know that we were invited. And when someone asked, "Well, why do you, you know, why do you always go to the, why do you always have these sessions that we're not invited to?" They said, "Well, let me explain what we're doing, and you're absolutely invited." And we had standing room only, right? And so it was really, it was about the invitation, but it was about the invitation from, right, about and tell them what you're trying to achieve that really made the difference for us. Thank you for this great panel. I'm Roberta Guise. I develop women as thought leaders. So in the last year or so, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, came out, and it's been in the women's chattosphere. I'm just curious if men have been thinking about it, talking about it, relating to it, and whether it's started to trigger any conversations in corporations. Thank you. Yeah, I have to say uh, the answer is I'm not familiar with the book, and uh, so I, you know, I can't really offer a comment. I've, I've heard the book mentioned in a number of settings, but it's not um, triggering any kind of organized or or significant uh, contact. There, some of her, her television interviews, I think, have been uh, had had some impact, and so I've heard more comments about the television, but. But not so much about the book. I've heard a couple of people mention the book, but um, in, in not entirely positively, actually, in, in terms of so uh, um, disagreements about whether or not. And I haven't read the book, so just answering your question. Uh, it, 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 it does. So that would then, I think, raise the question about how do we engage men's curiosity around the subject? So um, I read the book. And we had our CEO um, on stage with Cheryl at Facebook and invited a mix. And it, I was really happy to see it was a very blended mix of men and women from different businesses around the area to uh, just an auditorium to talk. And um, it was a bit of um, you know back and forth between the two of them about um, some of the points raised in the book. Um, the book, when I talk to colleagues, does seem to be controversial, probably more controversial with women than with men, which is interesting. And uh, But I think it's starting a conversation. And I think um, men are confused in some ways that I've talked to about what the real message is there and then what's the, what's the call to action for men. But I do think the examples that she gave about her own career in the book and about other relationships uh, with her family. When, when you read those and understand those stories, most of those each one of us can relate to and say, I've seen that happen before. And so I think it, it, those examples are really powerful. I'm actually um, currently writing a book. I, I write books is one of the fun things I do. And I'm currently writing a book about uh, instinctive behaviors, patterns of behavior. That, uh, we instinctively tribalize, we instinctively create hierarchies, we instinctively divide into us and them and treat people differently based on us and them. We instinctively create turf. We have a whole series of instinctive behaviors we have, and when you look at the patterns of instinctive behavior, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on in organizational settings because all organizations reflect the patterns established by our instincts, and our cultures tend to be the toolkit that we use to actualize the goals of the instincts. So we have instincts to have matrimony, and so every culture invents their own rules of matrimony. So the book is about the various patterns we have and, and um, basically how we can use those patterns more effectively to get along 
understand each other. And, and one of the chapters is on the incredible negative behavior that we have exhibited against women. The, the prejudice, the discrimination, the, the oppression, the suppression. The, the, that book, is a, that chapter I've written about seven times now, and it depresses me because you look at the horrible, horrible things we do in so many cultures in so many settings relative to women. And, I, and I've been, I just got back from Saudi Arabia and, and in Saudi Arabia, I was in a room with a couple hundred doctors from the Ministry of Health and the women in the room had to sit in the back of the room and they had to be completely and totally covered. And when they came up afterward to have their picture taken with me, they had to have complete covering on to have their picture taken. They, they couldn't even, and that was, the, the, these are physicians in the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia, and there are parts of the world where things are so negative relative to women, and when you look at the patterns of that behavior. So um, hopefully when I figure out that chapter and get it done, it will be useful, and my goal on that chapter is to start a dialogue. My goal is to get a conversation going where people can talk openly about these issues and, and uh, talk about how really um, bad those behaviors are in so many settings and have been for such a long time. Um, yeah, I just I want to call one issue. We don't really have time to discuss it because we've already overused your generosity. And one, I just want to thank you that you're the men we've been waiting for. And um, yeah. so thank you. Um, thank you for your own work, your own journey, and the work that you've done on yourselves. But this issue always brings us back to the fundamental issue of power. And uh, you talked about privilege. And um, you know, I tried to wrap my head around this um, in a very simple way. And it, it occurred to me that one of the simplest ways to see it is that I'm a member of, um, I'm a platinum or whatever I am, frequent flyer with United. And when I go to the airport, I love that I have privilege. I love that I get to go to the front of the line. I love that I you know, can sit in the red carpet room. And if they suddenly changed that rule and said, nope, it's first come, first serve and all that, I would be annoyed. So that's how I personalized it. So I wonder for you uh, in your closing comments after I know Rufus has a question, but um, what about power? Because I mean, it's really seductive. It, it's, really, it's really a tough one to share. And I gotta think that given the thousands of years we've been at work on this issue, that that's at the heart of it. And so how do you make sharing power attractive or compelling? <laughs> I'll give a, a quick reaction. Um, I, I think you're making an assumption there. And one of the, um, the de definitions of uh, privilege when you talk about diversity and, and about white males is, is the privilege is in the assumptions that people make about us and the assumptions that we make about them, and and the fact that white males generally don't have to think about some things that a lot of other people do about what you say and how it's going to be perceived, or a lot of other behavioral things. We just go about our, you know, dumb white guy uh, lives and and in, in uh, <laughs> joyful ignorance, um, and that's a privilege um, when you understand that. But the power comment, um, the assumption that I referred to is um, power is probably relative. And a lot of men probably don't um, express in a vulnerable way that their insecurities. And in a lot of organizations, we may look to somebody else. People may assume that we are very comfortable and confident in our power. We probably look to a lot of other people and think, wow, that person really has arrived, or I would like to be that person, but somehow we've been trained to um, have a veneer that um, that's not um, apparent to you. So I would just say don't, I, I, I have power, I guess, from the standpoint about being privileged around the assumptions, but I don't think of myself as having power. Yeah, I'd like to build on that comment, and it goes back to the question that was asked over here as well. Because you asked a question that we didn't really answer, which is how do you get men more curious? And I don't, I don't have an, I don't have a great answer for the question, but I do have an answer, and that is that in my experience, in in my little slice of the world, uh, 
it's not a one size fits all. Every male is a little different. And I'm sure, I don't experience it very often, at least I don't believe I do, but perhaps this is a part of my unconscious bias, right? Something I don't see as a white male. I don't experience uh, the misuse of power, or the abuse of power, or the, the uh, unwillingness to relinquish power. I experience much more what Jim described. But I'm confident that it exists somewhere, right? I'm confident that that happens. So I'm not denying it. But I, I did want to say that I think when you think about how to approach men and how to get them interested in this, it's, it's not easy. There's no one size fits all. It's not a book or an article. It's not a film. It's not a seminar. You have to, you have to understand the people you're trying to reach and approach them in a way that they're reachable. For me, it was going to that class. Now, you know, I didn't know that going in. I think my colleagues, when we all agreed to do it, uh, you know, males and females, we didn't know what we were going to get from it, so maybe I just got lucky. But I've observed as we've now encouraged most of our center directors to go through this, it's a mixed success rate. Some go and they come out as energized as I am, but right now I'm still mentoring a couple of white males who went to the class and came out nothing other than very, very angry white males. <laughs> so, you know, it's about, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the mind meld with him to understand how do I reach those individuals. One I know, he needed, he, he's, a, he's a PhD scientist, he needed facts. He needed numbers, he needed a hard business case where I needed something more emotional, right? Something that got me, you know, here. So that, you know, that's the answer I have to yours and to your, to your question. Yeah, my, my sense is that the power issue is a little bit like the, the privilege issue. And it's visible to the people who don't have it, but it's not necessarily visible or relevant to the people who do have it. It's just sort of assumed. So people aren't really working to maintain power because they don't even realize they have power. But if you don't have power, it's pretty obvious who does. And so I, I think that's part of a context issue. And, and the other thing is, I, I do think, uh, back to your, I love your analogy of the uh, airline status. Um, what we need to do to solve this is not to take away your status. What we need to do is increase everybody's status so that everybody has that same level of service. And, and I think that's the outcome that we've got to get to. Thank you all. It's been wonderful.